Hello and welcome to this SAC 2020 talk on index calculus algorithms for subfield curves. This was a joint project together with Stephen Galbraith, Robert Granger and Christoph Petit. The curves I'm going to talk about in the following are elliptic curves, which, just as a reminder, are non-singular plane curves satisfying some cubic equation over some field, with an additional point at infinity. Under the chord and tangent rule, the points on the curve form an abelian group and the point at infinity is the neutral element. The security of elliptic curve cryptography depends on the hardness of the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. That is, given a point p and a multiple of that point kp to compute the scalar k. For appropriately chosen parameters, this problem is very hard. Various such parameter sets have been standardized and are, due to the comparably small key size for the security of elliptic curve cryptosystems, widely used. The elliptic curves we looked at in this project are so-called Koblitz curves or subfield curves. These are elliptic curves which are defined over a small finite field fq, which is considered over a large extension field fq to the n, or put differently, the curve equation defining the elliptic curve has coefficients in a subfield fq, but we consider all solutions to the equation over the extension field. In particular, the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem lives in the extension field. Half of the curves standardized by NIST in their special publication, which gives recommendation for elliptic curve parameter domains, are Koblitz curves defined over the binary field F2. Nowadays, it is highlighted that those curves are being deprecated, but for some times those curves were popular as they allow for faster scalar multiplication of points. The reason for that is the Q-power Frobenius endomorphism, which is well defined on Koblitz curves. That is the map which sends a point to another point on the curve by raising the coordinates to the qth power. A natural question to ask is whether we can use the Frobenius endomorphism on Koblitz curves for cryptanalysis of the ECDLP. There are different strategies to attack the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem when well-chosen parameters are used. The most successful is still the use of generic algorithms such as Pollard's row. The curve and the ECDLP parameters are usually chosen such that the cardinality of the subgroup containing the discrete logarithm problem instance is of large prime order r. Pola's row algorithm then runs roughly in time square root of r. In 1998, Wiener and Zuccarato presented how the row algorithm could be improved on Koblitz curves by a factor square root of n where n was the extension degree of the field over the subfield the curve is defined over. As an aside, this result was also presented at SAC in 1998. Another variant to solve discrete logarithms is to use index calculus methods. This was a very active area of research until some years ago. The work in our paper gives a way to speed index calculus methods up for Koblitz curves, namely we accelerate the relation collection by a factor n and the linear algebra step by a factor n squared. The slightly easier case on speeding up index calculus to solve discrete logarithm problems in higher genus curves was previously discussed by Godry. As a small disclaimer, despite various speedups, the index calculus algorithms for ECDLP still perform worse than generic algorithms like polar rho for curves that are used in practice. Before presenting the core ideas of our paper, let's quickly recall the index calculus framework. The idea is to reduce the computation of discrete logarithms to a linear algebra problem. To this end, we first define some subset of the elliptic curve, or in fact any group one wants to solve a discrete logarithm problem in. This subset is called factor base. Then we collect relations, namely we take random linear combinations of the base point P and the point Q of which we want to compute the discrete logarithm with respect to the base point. Then we try to decompose the resulting point as a sum of factor base elements. If such a so-called relation is found, 
We save the coefficients of p and q and moreover save the coefficients in the sum over the factor base elements as a row of a matrix. We continue this relationship search until we have as many linear independent relations as there are factor base elements. And finally, we can compute a vector in the right kernel of the matrix. Uh, this allows us to then compute a solution to the discrete logarithm problem in the last step. In index calculus, there are various trade-offs one needs to consider. On one hand, we want to be able to write many group elements as a sum of factor base elements to keep step two from failing too often. On the other hand, we want to the factor base to not be too large as we need to find as many relations as there are factor base elements. Moreover, the factor base has to be chosen in a way that allows for the decomposition in the relation collection to be efficient. For elliptic curves, this problem is solved with two crucial ingredients. One is semi summation polynomial associated to an elliptic curve. Uh, they have the defining property that they have a root at x1 to xm, precisely if there exist values y1 to ym, such that the pairs xi, yi define a point on the elliptic curve and they sum up to the neutral element. The other ingredient for index calculus on elliptic curves is the so-called via descent. It refers to the fact that we can write polynomials over a field extension fq to the n as n equations over the subfield fq. Using these ingredients, the general index calculus framework got adapted by Semaev, Diem and Godry as follows. One defines the factor base using an fq vector subspace of fq to the n just by declaring that all points whose x coordinate lie in this vector subspace are part of the factor base. To collect relations, one then computes the linear combination of p and q and plugs its x coordinate into the semi polynomial and describes the other variables in the semi polynomials as using the vector space. Now, Everything left to do is finding a root of this polynomial equation. And this is usually done by applying first a vial descent and then solving the resulting polynomial system using Grudner basis techniques. Solving the polynomial system gets expensive very quickly, which is why a lot of previous work has been dedicated at solving the arising polynomial systems faster. Meanwhile, our work speed up is achieved by reducing the number of polynomial systems that need to be solved in the first place on Koblenz curves. But we'll come back to that shortly. Let's first make another observation. Elliptic curves are abelian groups and therefore solution to the point decomposition will always have m factorial many solutions in the previous framework given all the same, all corresponding to the same decomposition since we can reorder the points in the sum. Removing this redundancy is usually referred to as breaking symmetry. There are different approaches to do so. One is to rewrite the semi polynomials in terms of elementary symmetric polynomials, as was suggested by Fougère, Gaudry, Huo, and Renault, and later improved by others. This lowers the degree of the polynomial system that needs to be solved. Another idea is to use M disjoint factor bases and force the different points in the decomposition to be in different factor bases. That way one removes the factor M factorial due to symmetry breaking, but one needs M times as many relations as we have M factor bases, at least under the assumption that they all have the same size. This idea is attributed to Matsuo. However, for Koblitz curves, we can do better, and we need the following lemma for it. Uh, first, recall that for curves used in cryptography, the ECDLP instance usually lies in a subgroup of the curve that is of prime order and roughly as large as the entire group of the curve itself. For Koblitz curves, one can then show that on this subgroup containing the discrete logarithm instance, 
the Frobenius endomorphism acts by multiplication of an eigenvalue of the Frobenius endomorphism, which, by the way, can be computed efficiently. The idea for symmetry breaking is now as follows. As with Matsuo, we can choose M disjoint factor bases. Then we choose, well, we choose them in a specific form, namely the second one is the image under the Frobenius endomorphism of the first one, the third one, the second, the image of the second one, and so on. Constructing such factor bases is easy if we have a normal basis of uh, our extension field fq to the n over our subfield fq, but more details can be read in the paper. Now we proceed as follows. We first decompose points as sums of factor base elements, where we focus, where we fo force each point to be in a different factor base. This gives the full m factorial gain in symmetry breaking. Using the lemma, we can then rewrite the relation as one which consists purely of factor base elements in one of the factor bases, say the first one. As a consequence, we save the full factor m factorial due to symmetry breaking, but we do not inflate our factor base at all. Since the degree of the summation polynomial grows exponentially in m, m is usually fairly small in practice. And this means only a small speed up is possible by symmetry breaking. However, the Frobenius endomorphism allows further improvements to index calculus. Another idea is to choose a factor base that is actually closed under the Frobenius endomorphism. Given one relation with respect to that factor basis, we can then apply the Frobenius endomorphism to the entire relation to generate further relations. Since the factor base is chosen under is closed under the Frobenius endomorphism, this gives another decomposition of a point on the left-hand side and factor base elements on the right-hand side. The Frobenius endomorphism is of order n, so this looks like a good deal. But one needs to be careful. Depending on the factor base, the n relations might not be linearly independent. So potentially one needs to choose multiple factor bases and for some points to be in different factor bases than others. At least in order to attain the full speed up. But we can do even better than that even a better deal is possible. Uh, given a factor base that is closed under the Frobenius endomorphism, instead of generating many more relations from a single one, we can build in an ad hoc manner a re reduced factor base only containing one representative from each Frobenius orbit in the Frobenius invariant factor base. Given one relation from the larger factor base, we can then rewrite it in terms of a relation with respect to the reduced factor base using the previous lemma. This factor base, like the reduced one, is n times smaller and this means that we need to find n times fewer linearly independent relations and on top of that the matrix for the linear algebra to compute the right kernel is of dimension n squared times smaller. As sparse linear algebra techniques can be used for index calculus methods, this means that the speed up of linear algebra step is up to a factor n squared. Now, having these ideas in place, this raises the question how suitable factor bases can be constructed. We give some construction for different parameter sets in our paper, and one of them I want to mention here which arises from linearized polynomials. Let's consider the case where the base field is F2, as in most curves used in practice. We know how, to, how the polynomial x, n, x to the n minus 1 factors in this case, and uh, taking any of the factors of degree L, which where L is the order of 2 modulo n, uh, we can consider the following associated linearized polynomial and take as factor base for the elliptic curves all those points on the curve whose x-coordinates are a root of the linearized polynomial. One can see or convince um, yourself that 
this is a Frobenius invariant factor base and the, the size of the factor base is roughly 2 to the L, where L is again the order of 2 modulo L. In particular, this gives a good strategy to construct Frobenius invariant factor bases whenever the order of 2 modulo n is fairly low. So for Koblitz curves, n is always a prime for the curve to be secure in any way. And then one example where 2 modulo n is low are when n is a mesen prime, for example. However, in general, if the order is fairly large, we do not have a good enough fine control over the size of factor base uh, for this method to be suitable. Further Frobenius invariant factor bases can be constructed using isogenies between algebraic tori and elliptic curves respectively. These constructions are based on work previously done by Coveni and Glacier on Galois invariant smoothness bases. Some viewers of the presentation might have noticed a detail that I have skipped over so far. While we reduce the number of polynomial systems that need to be solved during index calculus when using Frobenius invariant factor bases, it is a priori not clear whether the system that remains to be solved can be solved in the same time as when more standard choices of factor bases are used. So are they? Well, to examine that, we ran some experiments on instances that were small enough to yield results. And we found that the answer seems to be that it depends. For factor bases from linearized polynomials, so the ones from the previous slide, the results look good and suggested that it takes roughly the same time. Meanwhile, the results for the other constructions looked less promising. Overall, further work is needed here. Which gets us to the open problems of this project. When using the Frobenius invariant factor basis based on the constructions of Coveni and Lassier, we have some additional homogeneous structure in the polynomial system, which we solve using standard techniques. It is possible that improvements with respect to this structure are possible and make Frobenius invariant factor bases of this type actually more competitive. Further, it would be good to study the practical impact of our improvements for Koblitz curves asymptotically and maybe run experiments also in different characteristics as we restricted ourselves to characteristic two. And finally, a big open problem is to get a precise complexity estimate for index calculus methods on elliptic curves in general. This would also allow for proper comparisons between elliptic curve uh, algorithms for index calculus, uh, well, index calculus algorithms for elliptic curves and polar row. However, while such a precise comparison seems to be out of reach, polar row seems to beat index calculus on curves that are used in practice. To summarize, our work shows how to exploit the Frobenius endomorphism to get a speed up by a factor n for the relation collection and n square in the linear algebra step for some Koblitz curves. We give some practical constructions for the required factor basis for some parameters. And this work also shows how, for some parameters, index calculus has a better speed up on Koblitz curves than it does for polar row algorithms. However, the speed up is logarithmic in the security parameters, and overall, index calculus still performs worse than polar row does to break the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problems on curves that are actually used in practice. Therefore, the security of Koblitz curves remains strong. Thank you for watching this talk and I'm happy to take any questions in the live session on Friday.